I'm Carl. I'm here to talk about Futel, which is a project I've been working on for, well, successfully working on for a short time and working on for much longer before that. Um, but first, I'm a little behind on all this because I, I was able to go and do something I've never done before, which is go outside of the continent. And I went to Europe. So here's some payphones from Paris. I like this one because it's, uh, it's just uh, out there in a kiosk in the open with a little roof over it. Uh, here's Budapest. I like this one because it has a non-verbal description on how to do it. Look how happy that guy is that he's using the phone. Yeah. Uh, this is my favorite enclosure. This is my favorite phone booth. It's just two pieces of glass. It's very open, one longer than the other. I think the wind is supposed to come from one way. I, I just like it because it's, so, it's not really there, but I think it's open because they don't want you to shoot up in there or something like that. And here's Prague but I don't have any phone booths from Amsterdam. I went to Paris, Budapest, Prague, and Amsterdam, and Amsterdam, I never went out of like the rich part of town, really, the touristy part of town, but I didn't, I still, I didn't see any phone booths, and Prague was very touristy, and it was full of phone booths. And why weren't there any phone booths in Amsterdam is what I don't understand. Um, I mean, there must have been phone booths at some time, but they took them away. And they take them away in Portland, too, as I'm sure you've noticed, and people ask me, a lot of times people ask me just for fun, where's the nearest phone booth? Because I, I often know, where's the nearest pay phone? And I tell them, I'm like, I was thinking about where it is right here. And I was sure the nearest pay phone is in the public library, the main library, first floor next to the bathrooms. But when I think about it, I'm really not sure about that. Because every time I think I know where one is, not every time, but often, I come back and it turns out they're gone. They've been gone for like a year or something. So I'm sure that the nearest phone booth is uh, Morrison and Broadway. I'm sure there is one at Morrison and Broadway. There might be one nearer. Does anyone happen to know where there's a nearer phone booth than that? Nearest payphone? Yeah. So the phone booths are disappearing. The payphones are disappearing. And we're, uh, that's something that we don't really like. And I'm, here's, I'm going to talk about why we don't like that and what we're doing about that. So that's what we're doing. To, to deal with that, we are starting a phone company. Uh, we are Portland's smallest phone company right now. Um, we are providing free telephony services to the public. And our elevator pitch is free phone company for bums. Um, I'll give you a little background about things that aren't necessarily related to us, but are inspirations for us from, from the recent years. Um, and that's the Freakers. Um, a lot of you have heard about the Freakers, I'm sure. Um, they were a hacker subculture which exploits the phone system. In fact, they weren't a hacker subculture. Well, they were a subculture, but they were the hacker culture of the time because in their heyday was the 70s. They were around from the 60s to the present. Um, but the, the 70s is when their, their peak was, and still in the 80s as well. But the heyday was, their heydays was in the 70s because in the 70s, if you wanted to interact with a computer, the phone was the computer that you, had, you were able to interact with. That was the computer system that you could interact with. You didn't have, if, if, if you wanted to interact with a programmable computer, then if you were able to, it was because you were a computer researcher. It was because you were a computer science researcher or a, a, some kind of number crunching geek that dealt with some kind of mainframe, big, big mainframe that you had a time sharing terminal with or something like that. Um, if you were writing a term paper in the 70s, you didn't you do it on a word processor, you did it on a typewriter. I was, uh, when I was a kid, my friend, his dad was uh, some kind of lab researcher or something like that. And he had a map of Zork, which was a printout of Zork. It was a, it was a dot matrix printout, which was awesome. But that was how, that was how we interacted with computers, just stuff like that. So the freakers were, so if you, wanted to, if you were a hacker, if you wanted to interact with a large computer system, something interesting like that, the phone was the way you had to do it. That's, that was what was available to you. So that's what that type of person gravitated to. And so this is the front page of uh, the Yipple zine, the Youth International Party Line. This is from September 1971. Um, they, were a, they were kind of the hacker auxiliary of the Yippies. 
um, they're, like they were those yippies that were that were hackers, and so they wrote a lot about. Uh, well, they were freakers. They wrote about exploiting the phone system. I really like this logo up in the corner of the Liberty Bell, the Bell system as the Liberty Bell, up in the up, upper right corner there. So they were, and so they would, um, they would hack into the phone system. They would manipulate it in ways that you weren't supposed to do, and they were, um, they were doing that to. Well, for several reasons. They were doing that to exploit the technology of the man, the big computer at the time, really. Um, one, this is 2600, a zine that a lot of you will be familiar with. Um, this is still being published today, but it, uh, um, this, this was a freaker zine that came on, that, uh, that uh, evolved into a hacker zine for general purpose computers. And, and that, that's what happened to freakers. Like eventually computers came, computers became something that they could access and there were other things to hack. But the name 2600 comes about because uh, a freaker named John Draper, who became known as Captain Crunch, learned that a toy whistle that you got in a Captain Crunch is a free prize in a, in a box of Captain Crunch had a 2600 megahertz tone in it if you blew it in a certain way. And that, if you blew that at a certain time into your phone, you could you could control the phone that way because they use a 2600 tone to manipulate the switching system. Because you didn't, at the time, the systems, well, maybe not completely, but they didn't, they were, they were programmed with tones. You didn't have a computer that you hooked up to the phone. They used, everything was, was, was sounds. Uh, your dial tone was a mechanically generated dial tone back then and stuff like that. So, they, so anyway, the freakers were, were hackers that messed with the phone system. And they did that for several reasons. Um, they did it because they were geeks, they were hackers, and a lot of you will know about just needing to explore technology like that. But they, you know, they were stealing, they were, they were trespassing on networks, they were getting free phone calls. Um, and so that was, you know, that was a big justifi justification for a lot of them. But they also had a political justification too, they were stealing from the man, you know, they were hippies. Um, here's an unrelated picture, it's a fair jumper, which is kind of, I've, I'm talking about this because this is the same kind of philosophy as a lot of the freakers. They, they, you have an exclusion system here, which is easy to circumvent, so therefore you must circumvent it. You're going to save a buck, but you must because it's too easy. And that was a lot of things about the phone system. They didn't, they didn't really bother to lock it down very good. Your early computer systems, for example, uh, the red box was something that was easy to make, so a lot of people may or may not have used back in the day, where um, if you put a quarter in your phone, um, it generated some tones, beep, 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 and that's how the phone knew that you put a quarter in there. That's how the phone system knew. So if you, if you played those tones into a phone, then the, as far as the phone was concerned, they, that you would put a quarter in there, and there you had a credit, so you could make free phone calls that way. So it was really easy to circumvent. Eventually, the phone companies um, had countermeasures, and the freakers came up with counter countermeasures. And fair jumping is a similar thing. You know, it's it's easy to jump a turnstile, and so sometimes there's countermeasures, and then there's sometimes there's hacks around there. And that has evolved to a current organization, which I read about recently in the paper called Planka, which is a fair jumpers union. Um, you join the union, you play a monthly, you pay a monthly due. You promise to never pay your fare if you can all help if you can all help it, and then if you get caught, they pay your fine. So it's kind of a way of seizing. They're they're advocating for a socialist public transportation uh, system. They're advocating forcefully. They're advocating by stealing it. But um, and that's you know that's been a theme that's going on. When I lived in Chicago, a bunch of people were trying to make the public transportation free because they said that 90 cents out of every dollar you, you paid for the train was used to actually handle the money. So there's some, I mean, that's some motivation for freaking. The motivation was stealing, but also exploration and stealing it because it needed to be stealing. And also because the phone company was the man back then. It was the phone company. It was Ma Bell, AT&T, eventually AT&T, or first of all AT&T. But anyway, the phone company was seen as an extension of the the, the man, the big government, and every dollar you stole, f stole from the phone company wasn't going to the war in Vietnam or something like that. Because this was the 60s and the 70s, this is when, this is a time after the 50s where people were kind of shedding the 50s trust, the institution feeling it, uh, and realizing that 
people were getting drafted to fight commies in, in the other side of the universe, you know. So there, there was a political motivation for it in a lot of ways, too. And that has extended into the present in a lot of ways. I mean, that extended to from the 70s to the 90s in the present. And in fact, this is a, this is a very recent EFF logo here. Um, they, just, they just changed that AT&T logo to whoever has most recently made an illegal deal with the feds or the NSA to spy on Americans or Angela Merkel or whoever. So there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's the idea of theft being a noble thing if you're, if you're stealing from someone who's bad. But mainly, you know, the, the idea is just to, to hack because you have to hack. You know, you have to explore something. You have to figure out how to, how to exploit something. Because, I mean, we're surrounded by machines. You all are using your laptops and phones and stuff. I'm, I'm, someone's reading this, listening to this on the web, I hope, in the future. You know, there's a, there's a drone recording me right now. We're, we're, we can't live without machines, so you want to explore them. So nowadays, uh, freaking has kind of been subsumed by by a, a larger hacker culture because there's just more to hack. But there's still a lot of phone hackers out there. This is a group that takes old switching equipment and connects it to the network and lets people play with it. So that's that's some background. That's a that's some past background. And you might wonder what what our project is that we're talking about. What Futel is, and what we are as a phone company. We are well, we're two, we're two main developers and several contributors. My day job is software engineering. My main partner is a messenger who's also into technology. And then we have a lot of people just helping here and there. But what we're doing is we're sticking phones in public places and not charging for them. So um, like I said, we're Portland's smallest phone company. And we are providing a bunch of services. And they're all free. And um, they are domestic calls, free domestic calls. Voicemail. Uh, we have an operator on call and other human interactions. So if you want to talk to a human being, but you don't necessarily have a human being to talk to, we want to supply that for you. Uh, we have one touch dialing to the mayor of Portland and some other people you can talk to. Um, we have a random payphone. You can ring a random payphone. In fact, the idea is that you will ring every payphone in Portland at once and talk to whoever picks up the first one. Um, we have um, links to a bunch of social services and stuff like that. Um, not as organized as it should be, but we're, we'd like to make it a social project as well. Um, we have a bunch of interactive things to do. We have a radiation meter in one of our phones at Geiger counter. So uh, if, you're, if you're wondering how radioactive your sample is, you can hold that up to your phone and get a readout from that. Uh, we have a Nintendo machine. If you've ever wanted to play Tetris on the phone, uh, you can do that through one of our phones. To be honest, that's a demo project because, well, because it's a, there's a screen, you know, it's outside of the phone, but it's not our our screen is not uh, hostile user proof. You know, these phones. One thing I love about these pay phones is that they are. I mean, look at that thing. It's um, I'd never hefted a phone before I started collecting them from Craigslist and stuff, and uh, they're they are they're made to be abused. If you're mad at your dealer, you take it out on the phone. So like. They, they are made for people to abuse them. And, and our, our Nintendo game is not ready for that yet. Anyway, other stuff like that. We have, some, we have some planned art projects like audio zines and interactive stuff. We've got someone who's developing a choose-your-own-adventure game. I've always wanted to play Hunt the Wumpus on the phone. So that's what we are. That's what Futel is. Um, we are not freakers. We are not hacking in any black or white sense, black hat or white hat sense, because um, we're customers. We are buying service and giving it away. So I'm, I'm sorry if that's less exciting than the, than the, uh, than the freakers there. But we are social hackers in that we are. We want to find out how people will use this. Um, what happens if we if we give this away? We want to help people and confuse them also because I mean this installation is this is in front of my house by the way, but this is um, this one is. I'm always interested in who picks this phone up because I don't pick up any random payphone I see. This we have our we ha we have our Futel logo, which is not yet um, in front of this phone here. It's not obvious that this is going to be anything interesting right now, um, except that why would there be a payphone in front of someone's house? So it's interesting to see who picks it up and how they use it. We don't you know we don't 
we don't invade anyone's privacy. We don't record their calls. We don't record their numbers or anything like that. But uh, but I do know like what menu options are used and stuff like that. So it's fun to see. Um, and I'm wondering how the word gets out and who uses it and what they think about it, really. So that's what we're wondering, is how can we help people and maybe annoy and confuse them at the same time? And really, really we just miss phones. We, we don't like that the pay phones are going away. We don't like that urban furniture going away. And really, it's just that we live in this time of awesome individual geek power. And it makes you just want to do something. It makes you want to create something that people will interact with. Because back in the day, to run a phone company, even Portland's smallest phone company, you would need uh, an army of, of IT department guys, linemen, infrastructure. You'd need large computers and switching systems. And we can do this on some very cheap infrastructure. Um, uh, I should describe that infrastructure very quickly because I don't, I, I'm really not going to go into technical detail here, but um, we run an asterisk, it's called an asterisk server, it's a VoIP server, voice over IP, which lets you connect computers with the phone service. Here, I'll give you something more interesting to look at. There's some, there's some, uh, this is a COCOT, by the way, customer operated, coin operated, customer owned coin operated telephone. Um, it's basically a way that you could make a payphone from a line, from a wall phone, with a wall line, a residential line, or something like that. Very annoying for us to work with. Um, so an, an Astro server is a VoIP server, voice over IP. When we run an Astro server on a digital ocean box, a cheap uh, virtual box that we rent, their cheapest one, that, seeps, that speaks a protocol called SIP. And I just had to learn a new acronym at work, and I. I have acronym burnout, and I forget what SIP stands for, but SIP is, SIP is a VoIP protocol. So we get these little Linksys boxes, SIP boxes, that um, you plug a phone into one end, and you plug the Ethernet in the, in the other end, and that speaks SIP to the asterisk box. We plug that SIP box into a Linksys router, which is running DDWRT, and the reason we're running those Linksys routers, if any of you were at the talk, if any of you were at the talk before here, um, is because the standard Linksys firmware for any router tends, tends to have, be really buggy. It tends to have, it, they, t they tend to not really care about their clients, and then they tend to have NSA backdoors or something in them. So we, so we run DDWRT in our router, and the reason we do that is, well, for that reason, and also because that can be an open VPN client in the router. So that lets us, lets, let, lets our SIP box talk to our router, which tunnels to our Open VPN box, also a digital ocean box, a, a cheap cloud box, which talks to our asterisk box. And the reason for that is because asterisk is this big, horrible piece of software. It's, it's great, it's open source, it's well used, there's lots of people using it, there's lots of forum posts with lots of annoying mouth breathers trying to talk about how they can hack asterisk and stuff like that. But, um, I mean, you can buy an asterisk, you can buy a VoIP service in a box where you just buy a computer and a service contract, you need the service contract, and you plop it down in your office and you put your sales phones on it and stuff like that. But so it's, it's, a, it's a large piece of software. We don't know all the different options about what it does. And if we plug one into the open net, within 30 seconds, people start rattling the door the doorknobs and trying to break in and, and connecting and stuff like that. So we have to we have to close down how how you connect to the void box with the, with our open VPN server. So that's it. That's our inter, that's our infrastructure. It's uh, three digital ocean boxes for production and stage and some nifty deployment scripts to one one button deploy to stage or promote to prod. And then some less nifty but still boilerplate uh, Installation instructions for putting putting our firmware on the on the routers and stuff like that. We brick a few routers. It's an interesting world uh, for doing that if you don't really know what you're doing. And these SIP boxes are the horrible thing because they're totally cool. They're little Linksys boxes. They're doing they're doing SIP. They're doing all this VoIP stuff in a little piece of hardware. You know, there's a lot of entropy in there. There's chips. There's heavy metals. There's gold. You know, circuit boards. And the way a lot of these were made was you could buy VoIP service. And you'd you'd buy monthly service, and they you'd buy the SIP box with it, and they would carrier lock it to the carrier, so you couldn't use a different VoIP provider. And uh, the so then so then you know these 
these people, you know, quit using these VoIP services and they put these boxes on Craigslist or eBay or Goodwill or something like that, and we get them for cheap, and it's hard to tell if they're carrier locked. So it's this, this intricate piece of hardware that, you know, a lot of resources and energy went into, and it's worthless now because you can't, you can't lock it. There's all sorts of tutorials on how you might be able to unlock it, but um, it's, we, we've never succeeded, and you just have to throw it away. It's, it's, it's literally evil, and I don't like it. So that's one of our big hurdles. And so anyway, our, our asterisk box is talking to our SIP provider, which is that's where we spend the money for our connectivity. It costs us a penny a minute for outgoing calls right now. And everything else is free for us, except for renting the, the uh, virtual boxes. That is our infrastructure. The next, pe next thing people ask me about um, when I tell them I'm a phone company mogul is why? Why are we doing this? Um, because it is rather stupid if you think about it. So I'll tell you some, some previous and ongoing projects of mine and my partners, which are not related to Futel, but I, I kind of want to uh, maybe give you some ideas of why we would do this. One of them is Chunk 666. We, we take old junk bikes and we cut them apart and weld them together and make them into different bikes, tall bikes, choppers, and stuff like that. This is an amphibious bike. Every year we go on an amphibious camping trip to Ross Island, which if you're not from Portland is a toxic waste dump in the middle of the river and camp out there. This is the SPS 700. Um, if you go to the party tomorrow the, at the Rail Heritage site, you really should because that's where this guy lives, or lady, they call it the lady. But um, it's a steam engine that uh, it used to pull the Empire Builder. It's from the 50s. Mm, no, no, 35, sorry. It was built in 35. But anyway, it's this wonderful giant steam engine that they decommissioned, and then they stuck it at Oaks Park as, a, as an exhibit. And you can't do that with a steam engine. You can't leave it out in the rain without maintaining it. So a bunch of people broke in periodically, and Gorilla maintained it. They'd lube it and keep it, keep it kind of able to be rehabilitated until they could make a group and make it running again. And this is the Church of Robotron, which we took a 80s coin-op video game called Robotron, um, which you all must be familiar with, and turned it into an interactive post-apocalyptic training facility. So the, the reason for all these things is because, well, like I said about those SIP boxes, we're living in a world where we're just turning we, we have all this amazing technology and we're turning it into trash. And we're taking all these skills and all these objects and making them obsolete, but they may not be obsolete again in the future. We may wish that we had these skills. And I want to have some of those skills, you know. I want us to be able to, I want us to be able to, uh, to, to still use these things and run them someday, the ones that are interesting and useful, you know. I mean, there's plenty of things that's worth forgetting, but I think these are some things that aren't worth forgetting, and one of them is the phone company. Yeah, I want to build something that's, uh, I want to build something that's, that's kind of keeping this technology alive and these ways of interacting alive. And another thing that has always influenced me personally is uh, zines. Um, Zines are kind of the continuation of communications technology, starting from the Gutenberg Press, which turned very expensive book-creating technology into something that could be cranked out. And then a bunch of printing, offset printing, mimeographs, stuff like that kind of ended. And eventually, the pinnacle of the photocopier, the Xerox machine, let anyone publish their whack job pamphlet, um, let any kid sneak into their mom's office in the middle of the night and make their little books and distribute them. Um, and I've always been interested in that, and this is something that I personally was not ever involved in, but this is a, a big influence for Futel. It's called the Apology Line. In the mid-90s, a man who called himself Mr. Apology, his name was Alan Bridge, I think, put up these flyers in New York City inviting people to call his Apology Line and apologize. You'd call it up, and there'd be an introduction, and then it would record you. It was an answering machine, basically, and you would apologize for whatever you did that was wrong. You would confess your sins. And then he would compile them and make a kind of a best of, and you could hear those. And then you could comment on them, and he would have a little comment discussion board after that. All very low tech, all, all just based on voicemail and the answering machine. Um, low tech, interactive, uh, but technological way for people to communicate. And uh, 
I, I listen to it a lot because I happen to be able to get free phone calls in the mid-90s. So that's something that's always kind of, that's, that's the kind of thing I want to uh, replicate. So that's some more background. Um, that's, that's some things that have inspired us. Um, but another thing uh, I want to tell you about is why Futel, why a phone company? Why do we want to put up these street kiosks, this interactive street hardware? And the reason for that is because we want to illustrate the, the like I said, the technology of everyday life, the meaning of the technology, the machines that we all interact with all the time. And to me, that means public, public hardware. You know, nowadays, everyone talks into your phone, your, your, your personal equipment, your phone that you have in your pocket, which, you know, you throw away after a few years. The battery goes bonkers or something like that. But I really like the, the public hardware that you touch. You know, you get diseases on your hands from using a public keyboard and stuff like that. And this illustration here is either a cover or a graphics novel. I'm not sure. But um, uh, if, I wonder if anyone can guess what this for. What book is this for? This is, huh? Shadowrun? No, but th uh, that's the genre. Yes, it's for William Gibson's trilogy, Neuromancer, Count Zero, Mona Lisa Overdrive. And you can see uh, Cyberpunk with Mirror Shades, and he's holding his deck. You can see some urban shaman rooting through the trash in the back. You can see a kind of a Japanese-American dystopian combination there. And you can, oh, and you can see Molly Money Eyes there with her mirrored eyes. But you can see a payphone right there. And that was in all of his Cyberpunk books. He couldn't think of a world without payphones. He wrote them in the 80s. And there's this great scene where the protagonist, Case, is walking by a bank of payphones, and the, the AI antagonist makes each one of them ring as he walks by them. It's, it's something that was, I mean, you, you couldn't think of that world going away in the 80s. Uh, it's obvious now. But we, we, want, we want to see that street hardware stay alive. And another reason is, just living in my neighborhood, uh, there's a lot of what we call Clinton Street Cadillacs going down my street, which is people pushing their carts with their cans in it and stuff like that. And we want to be able to provide a service to people, um, something that's nice. You know, we want to we want to build something that encourages people to be nice. There's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of interactive art these days. There's Twitter bots and stuff like that, and a lot of them are kind of mean, you know, mean spirited, and I want to be still cynical, you know, still obnoxious, but I still want to be nice. You know, one of the, one of the uses of these phones, like I set these up, I, whenever I throw a party, I set up a few phones and let people call people on the phones. And everyone makes prank phone calls, you know, that's what's fun to do. But I've never seen anyone make a mean prank phone call. It's always a prank phone call where it's, you know, the other guy will laugh once, once they figure it out, maybe, you know. And, you know, people don't have to be nice, but I want, that's what, that's something when I give people connectivity, that's what I think of them being able to do. And so there's this guy who, uh, there's this guy in my neighborhood. I, I didn't mow my lawn for about two years. It needed to be mowed. And this guy, one day, uh, I got a knock on my door, and this, uh, this guy's there with his lawnmower on the sidewalk asking me if I need my lawn mowed, and I did. So he became my lawnmower, and, but he couldn't keep his phone charged up all the time. He had a phone, but he couldn't always pay for his minutes. So he would just come by every week pushing his lawnmower, doing his route, and um, asked me if I needed a lawnmower. And um, sometimes I wasn't home or I didn't need it yet or something. I didn't want it done every week. So I thought it was, it was too bad that he couldn't call me. It would be great if he could have a phone. So there's, there's some of my uh, motivation there. And the main motivation for me is that it's, it's something that hasn't really been addressed with, with all the mental health talk here at Open Source Bridge, which surprised me, is that is that I... I get really down when I'm idle. You know, when I'm not doing something, I wonder what's, you know, what am I doing with the world here? What's, is, am I worth, am I at all worthwhile? So I always need to have a project going of some kind. And uh, this will be the final slide because I think it, I think it illustrates the Futile project the best, really. You know, it's, um, I, I always need to have something going. So I'm always starting, not always starting some project, but I'm, if I'm not, if I don't have a project, I'm casting around to start something. And my problem is that I can't tell if a project's going to be realistic or not until it's too late, until it's really too late to back out. So that's why, that's why I end up being a phone company mogul. 
um, it's kind of a recurring theme of practical jokes that I tend to play on myself. So having told you about Futel and the motivation behind it, um, I'd like to invite you all to contribute. We can always use operator posts. If you'd like to sign up to get a call when someone needs an operator, that would be great. We have an artist in residence program. If you have anything you'd like to do with the audio, uh, audio interface, uh, we can help you with that. Uh, we can always use phone locations if you have a place that we can put a secure phone. That would be great. And we can always use hardware, uh, VoIP hardware, public kiosk equipment, and stuff like that. Um, so thank you very much. If anyone has a question or anything like that, I'd be glad to tell you. Thank you. I want to put this slide up because I, I like her. She's having fun with her phone. Is there a source available? Yeah, there is source available on GitHub. Um, Did you see that? I think. Oh, right. Anyway, it, my username is KRA, and the project is Futel. So yes, it's, it's on uh, it's on GitHub. There's source available. It's actually interesting working with this uh, asterisk stuff because it was made. Sorry, I don't have net in this room. But um, yes, there's source available on GitHub. My name is Carl Anderson. My username is KRA. The project is Futel. There's several Futel projects in my repo, uh, Futel installation. This software was made by people who, I mean, it was. Whenever I find someone who's used this stuff, I, we always commiserate about, about asterisk because it was, it was made as a learning project for a lot of people. And I really think it was made by people who worked in IT departments that wanted job security. So it was hard to do things like make it build without being attended to, without having a console that you type into and stuff like that. Yeah, hi. Well, we don't do a guerrilla style because um, that's your second question, right? How do we do, how do we get into the public space? We don't do a guerrilla style because we, you know, because a, a, a payphone costs us like a hundred to two hundred bucks, you know. So um, we we would like to, in fact, we would like to do some cheaper installations. Let me get this here. So Futel, Futel is kind of our, our overview of how we're doing stuff. That's not so interesting. But Futel installation tells you how to, uh, how to install and configure this, if you want to see that URL. So we don't, we don't do this guerrilla style in public locations because we, our equipment is still too expensive, mainly our phone equipment. But that's why we like using these SIP boxes and these um, commodity routers, because all that is very cheap if you can get that going. Um, we, I actually, I really wanted to put it on the sidewalk in front of my house. I, uh, where I live, it's all concrete. There's no grass or anything like that. So I really wanted to put it there. So I, I called the city and asked them about, uh, about it. And I made sure not to say I was doing anything that even remotely looked like a payphone because I didn't want to say some magic words that made them think, you know, public uh, commerce type thing. So I said uh, interactive audio installation or something like that. But anyway. It's it's like 450 bucks a year to have to put something in the public right of way because an inspector needs to come out and vet it. So no, it's not gorilla at this time. Yeah, and then and then they would thank us. They'd probably shake, come out and shake my hand or something. Yeah, right. I mean, there's what we want to do is um, stick a phone in one of these empty. You see all these empty kiosks everywhere. So stick a phone in there and just hook it up and then see how long it takes for someone to notice that it's a gorilla phone, really. Too bad I just told you all my master plan. But um, like, like just riding home yesterday, I saw a bunch of empty kiosks, you know, stuff like that. Um, and 
it's, I mean, I, it, we can have the phones be wireless. They need power right now, but the power is very low. It's just these two little uh, five volt wall warts that run it. So imagine something that's like powered by solar or something like that, that has a built in, has built in wireless and if it can't find an open network, it cracks the nearest WPA2 network or something like that. So you can just imagine that you can just stick this phone in and run away, and eventually there'll be a phone service. And imagine you're sitting in your living room, and all of a sudden a phone comes crashing through your window and lands in front of you and starts ringing, and you pick it up and it asks you if you'd like to install a Futel phone in front of your house. Of course you will, you know. So, but but right now no, right now it's not Gorilla. And sorry, what was your first question? Uh, Oh, well, so it's just hooked up to my home internet. So it's a, a phone talking to the SIP box, which is, that's talking Ethernet, which is talking to a router, which is hooked up to the internet. Yeah, yeah. But we do, I mean, that's one of the cool things about these, about DDWRT and these, these, these uh, firmwares is that you can have it do wireless as the upstream. So we can, we can do a wireless as well. Yeah. I suppose that would be nicer, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. About, um, how many uh, Well, that, I mean, it, it depends on things like if you go to Goodwill and if you take, if you write down a list of what the working routers are for DDWRT and then you go to Goodwill and snarf up all the routers that match that, and then you come home and you look through a bunch of forum posts and you realize that they do support it, but it takes a lot of you know head scratching and pain and screaming to do it, and you should never use that version of the router. Then it takes many hours. But I think if you have the right hardware, which is not too hard, uh, probably an hour. Yeah, just plug it in. Yeah, um, including. Uh, and basically, basically, it's just. And if you actually, if we had, if we had uniform firmware, then we could just flash an image, a pre-made image, and flash it on there. We don't tend to have uniform firmware. We we operate very cheaply. So it basically just means installing DDWRT or Tomato. Um, we don't really. We're not experts on that. So we just. So there's probably more options than that. But that's what we use. Well. I mean, soon every one of them will be named after us, I'm sure, yeah. Yeah? So do you have just, uh, how many installs do you have? One. <laughs> I was hoping no one would ask that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> more of that if, like, any of the phone companies have had a little, uh, you know, conversation with you. No, we're very under the radar right now. Um, we have one install. I mean, that that turned out to be a lot of work. Is pouring cement. You know, it turns out a lot of infrastructure to get a secure phone there. We have one. My partner's putting one in front of his house, and we got some. We got some interesting. Some people who are interested in it. Yes. But soon, every corner, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Some of that w that would be cool, yeah. But it's it's really a question of what we know, really, and what what we learn. Because a lot of this stuff is really cool, but it's all I mean, it's all in development, and it's hard to sometimes it's hard to like jump into the docs. Like the the Open WRT talk here before, I was looking at my I was looking at my laptop. Um, while it was going, trying to trying to figure out more about it, because we want to do we want to put a pirate box, we want to put a USB port in the phone. You know, we want to let people thank you charge and stuff like that. And I go to the dock section, and there's a 404. You know, so it's 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 I mean for good reasons. It's it's all changing. It's all under development and stuff like that. But one thing that would be cool is um, giving people SIP phones that could connect to our network as long as they have wireless or something like that. And just in general, that's, that's some of the socially redeeming things that we would like to be able to do, like give people voicemail that they can access from, well, right now you can access it from another phone, from just calling into a number. 
but but voicemail they can give out a number to someone else and they wouldn't know that this guy is necessarily homeless and doesn't have his own phone because you you call in a separate number to leave voicemail or something like that. Yeah. I mean, so that idea is really cool. Yeah. 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 Do you have angel funding yet? No, we don't have angel funding. We don't have any funding. We're hoping that we can get something like a year of of expenses paid or something like that. We do have a tour camp art grant. Um, we're going to tour camp in a week or two. So that's actually, uh, that bought us a few phones and stuff like that. We're hoping, we're hoping we can get some kind of, you know, very small grant or something like that. It's hard to, it's hard to really convince people when your elevator pitch is free phone company for bums. Yeah. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you.